As I said, this talk is about closing lanes of traffic on the strategic road network. We'll quickly fly through the agenda. I'm going to do a brief introduction. I'll state what the problem is. We'll take an inventory. We will build the solution uh, and then we'll see if there's time for questions at the end. So a quick introduction. My name is Gary Shaw. I am clearly not a Teams MVP. Um, I'm a freelance uh, principal data scientist. My kind of elevator pitch is that I build teams in cloud based analytical platforms and I use them to predict the future. If you want to contact me, you can find me on my email address at Gary at Duncoding It. You can find me on uh, Twitter and I'm also I've also got a YouTube, YouTube channel which you can find there. So I work in the full analytics web stack that includes uh, web stack, the full analytics stack that includes um, data architecture, data engineering, analytics, visualization and coaching. And the kind of coaching that I do is at the C-suite level where people are starting to move their data into the cloud and they're starting to uh, ask questions around what does this mean in terms of AI machine learning for us. I also coach people who are currently senior data architects and they're looking to make that jump up to CIO, CDO level. OK, so why are we here? So I thought it would be a <laughs> good question. Uh, I thought it would be interesting just to kind of um, give you a demonstration of the sort of things that um, data scientists do on a day to day basis and the kind of problems that we're presented with and how we go about tackling them. So I thought I would just kind of give you this um, an, an idea of, of what it is we're about. So here's the problem that um, I've been given. I come into work one day and I'm giving this problem. Somebody says to me, so as a road incident manager on the strategic road network of the Kingdom of Garitopia, it's a great place to be, by the way, when a traffic incident occurs, I want to be able to choose the optimum traffic management solution to minimize delays. OK, so let us go ahead and define some terms there, right? So when we're talking about traffic incidents, OK, we're not talking about planned um, road works or things like that, planned closures. We're talking about this kind of thing where lorries jackknife and shed their load and there's an, there's an instantaneous incident and as a traffic manager, you have to deal with that. What kind of lane closures and procedures are you going to want to put in place? Um, the other thing that we need to um, talk about is is delays, how, how we're going to define delays in the context of of this little um, session. So a delay is simply going to be the difference between um, vehicle density and flow, and I'll talk about what they are um, later on. The difference between the traffic density and flow at the start of the incident versus the density and the flow at the end of the incident. And if the one at the end is bigger than the one at the start, then you have a delay and we can kind of quantify what that delay is. So the first thing we're going to do when presented with a problem like that is I'm going to take an inventory. So what is it that we actually have and what is it that we actually know? So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read the research. So having read the research, I find that um, we're not really any further forward. There is lots and lots of research on traffic flow out there, but a lot of it depends on uh, empirical observations, and we don't have that. We're right? in the in the kingdom of Garitopia. We don't have the ability to um, to look and gather empirical evidence on all of the types of things that we need to know um, enabled in order to be able to do really detailed traffic um, analysis. However, what we have, do, what we do have, is we do have the road network um, in an in um, network form. So when you're looking at the at the road in network form, you see these um, nodes or vertices, depending on how you name them, and, and edges or, or links um, in a typical kind of graph. Uh, this is obviously a directed graph. So we see that kind of directed graph and that represents our roads where the nodes are the junctions and the edges are the, the roads themselves known as links. And we can see here some, um, some of the uh, links are bidirectional, um, so that's uh, north south, and, and ones are, and some are single directional. I, you can only go that way. So, by looking at this network, we know um, what road we're on. We know whether we're going north south or east west, um, and we also know the idea is once you've joined the link at a particular junction, the idea then is that you can't leave. Now that's not entirely true because there are there are services, roadside services and things like that that you can pull off onto. And um, since the some of them now have um, hotels and things like that on them, you can actually your car can actually disappear from the from the link one day and reappear another day after you've spent um, the night in a 
in a travel lodge um, at roadside services. But other than that, the idea is that you cannot leave a link um, once you've once you've joined it. The other thing we've got is the ability to count vehicles, and we do this through induction loops. And an induction loop is is pretty much just a set of wires and current on the road, and it counts the vehicles as it goes through. Some of the induction loops, they, they do a bit more than that. They kind of give you an idea of the speed of that vehicle. It can also count the axles, so you know whether you're in a car, a lorry, or a bus, or something like that. But we're, we're going to ignore that side of things just for this short presentation. We're going to concentrate on the fact that we can count vehicles. OK, so is that kind of an impossible task? Um, and these are the kind of these are the kind of things that that the first thing you have to do is ask yourself when that's brought to you. So knowing only a vehicle count, can we actually carry out this work? And the first thing I always ask myself is, well, do I actually have to do what it is that you asked me to do? Um, it's kind of the the um, eternal teenager in me. It's like, do I have to do what you asked me to do? And whilst I'm kind of asked to do a full traffic modeling uh, and all that kind of thing to give to give the incident managers the absolute latest and greatest information. Do I really need to do that or do I really can I actually help them? Can I can I take them a stage further while I'm working out how to do these other things and bearing in mind to do these other things? We may not even have the technology, so new technology might be in place, but you can't just throw up your hands, shrug your shoulders and go, no, sorry, it's, it's too difficult. You have to do something and sometimes Anything that you can do is better than what they have right now. And what we have in Garytopia right now is traffic incident managers with a lot of um, experience and they'll put in lane closures um, and lengths and times based on their kind of gut feel over 20 years experience of, of what's what. So if we can actually bring any data and analytics to bear on this. It, it will be better than what we have at the minute. So that's where we're going to go. Um, one of the things that you learn very quickly as a data scientist is just because you can't achieve what was asked doesn't necessarily mean to say you have to shrug your shoulders and walk off. You can still make an impact um, to the business. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to do the data engineering. So if we just have a quick look at that, we pull up. Well, oh, that was lovely. Thank you for that, um, Excel. If we pull up Excel, this is what this is what we actually get. So we're going to do the data engineering, but we're not going to look at the code because the code around data engineering is never really particularly interesting. So these are um, these are the the readings, and this is what we get um, when we look at the actual induction loops. We get a date, so the date that the induction um, the date that the measure was taken, a link which identifies the road. So in this case, in Garytopia, it's the M1. We only have one motorway in Garytopia. Um, so this is the M1 between junctions three and four southbound. Um, it, it does its vehicle count in periods of 15 minutes. So this is period one, i.e. it's the first 15 minutes. So it's midnight to midnight 15 or on the 1st of March 2020. And here it's and here is the measure which is taken the number of vehicles that it's counted in that 15 minute period. So the first bit of data engineering that we're going to do is we're going to pivot that data. So when we look at this measure here, what we see is every row is an actual measure. What we want to do is we want to pivot it so that every row is an actual day. So here we have the date. So here we have the date, the link, and then periods one through 96 all the way along there um, so that we have one row representing a day now. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to aggregate up the measures um, to an hour because um, for some things, 15 minute lay intervals are quite interesting, but for this in, in terms of flow and density, we are we're more interested in in hours. So let's just define these terms quickly. Flow is the number of vehicles passing a fixed point in an hour. Well, actually it's in a unit of time, but we're going to go for an hour. And um, so here on that first row, you can see um, here in the first hour, there was only one one vehicle. Um, early hours of the morning, only one vehicle passed in that hour. So that's flow. Density is the number of vehicles um, per unit uh, of distance. So the number of vehicles in a mile, for example. So that's the difference between flow and um, flow and density. So once we've done this measure uh, and we've we've aggregated up the measures into the hour, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to aggregate that across five years because I want the the most accurate um, information that I can get. So I'm going to take an average over five years. So I've done a number of things here. 
Firstly, these first two columns, what I've done is I've taken the day of the week and the week of the year because we want to be able to compare. Um, we want to be able to compare and aggregate across um, days um, about the same day every year. So I don't really care what the traffic was on my road on the 1st of March, for example, because the 1st of March is a movable feast. It, it will move um, forward a day. And what I want to do is I want to know um, what the traffic was like on Monday morning on the on the 10th week of the year. So now I can compare them like for like throughout the year and I can also look backwards through five years and I can aggregate that up. And how I've aggregated that up is I've taken the maximum figure, so the maximum count, the minimum count, the, the average and the standard deviation. And we'll speak a little bit uh, about why I've done that later on when we come to look at the code. So that's basically really the only um, data engineering that we have to do. So let's um, jump into the code now. Um, here we go. Right. So what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to bring in some libraries that I'm going to use um, and then I want to open that data, that aggregated five years data and just have a look at it. Yeah, that's all. That's all what I expected to see. That's good. So our definition of um, a delay is going to be where the entry um, density, that's vehicles per unit of measure, uh, sorry, vehicles per unit of distance, um, going into, so beef on the link, but before the incident, and how that looks like um, compared to the density actually in the incident or just as you leave the incident. So that's what we're that's what we're going to do. So if we scroll down here a little bit um, to this part here, we can look at um, a naive implementation. OK, so a kind of naive, a, a first go as it were. And bearing in mind we're, we're just experimenting here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the entry flow. So if we just take a look and see what um, entry flow looks like. Um, what I do is I pass in a date, an hour and a and the the data uh, the data frame, and what I do is I just um, I just look at the um, the actual measure. So what was the count? So on this day, um, on this day of the week, on this week of the year, for this particular hour, what was the what was the flow? And um, so I get that straight from the um, induction loop information. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to then calculate the density. So if we have a look up here at, um, at density, then density is is simply just the flow divided by the speed. I'm just going to click on these, make sure they're actually defined. So doing that, what I'm going to do is um, I'm, I've got to configure some information. So here I've just got a class which is just going to hold some variables for me um, to kind of help me not have to pass in so many variables. So we've kind of we've got the day which is the 3rd of March. We've got the hour of the day which is um, 6 p.m. Average speed on the link which we've said is 70. Average speed in the incident which we say is going to be 50. We're going to close um, two lanes of three that are available and we're going to close it for 45 minutes. So to have a look at that, we we um, calculate the flow, as I said, we calculate it um, and then we calculate the density. So if we just have a quick look at that and um, run that, what we see is we're going to get, um, so the flow here is 3,488 vehicles per minute, the, uh, sorry, per hour, the um, density is 49 vehicles per mile, and that's marked as being um, unstable traffic expect delays. Now, if we just go here to where that comes from, we can see this function here called categorize flow and density. So you give it a flow, you give it a density and you categorize it. And all it does is to check to see if the flow and the density is in uh, is in particular ranges. Now, this is what I was talking about, about doing some research. These all look like magic numbers, but these are magic numbers which define categories of traffic. So um, if the flow and the density is less than these numbers, then it's free flowing with no delays, there's stable traffic with no delays, unstable traffic expect delays, and then traffic breakdown expect severe delays. And this is why looking at the research is important. Um, although the research um, didn't give us any, any kind of specific help because we just don't have the empirical devices on the roads in Garatopia in order to do that work, it, it did give us these 
um, categories that we can use to to just make um, the calculations a little bit more meaningful. I mean, I can say to somebody that the flow is 3,400 and I can say that the density is 50 cars per mile, but actually being able to say that actually that represents unstable traffic and you should expect delays is a lot more helpful. So that just kind of that function there helps us map the actual calculations of flow and density into something that's um, human readable. And that's what our um, that's what our traffic incident managers are wanting, something uh, but human readable. So once we do that then, and we have a look at that, we can look at the, the um, we can look at the uh, entry flow. So the entry flow is already unstable. So it is 6 p.m., it's in the middle of the rush hour. So already we'd be expecting delays here. And what we want to do now is we want to calculate our exit flow. So the exit flow is, what we expect it to um what we expect it to be um at the at either in the incident or just as you leave the incident and we've got this function here which is going to estimate the density the exit density and the exit flow based on what the actual measures were um for normal flow so normal flow in the link before we had our incident so how we're going to calculate this is we're going to get hold of our entry flow we're going to get hold of our um, density. So that entry flow there, we just look that straight up out of the um, induction data. The entry density, we just calculate um, from the formula. And then what we're going to do is we're going to see what is the what is the size of um, the effect. So it's how many minutes are we going to have our lane closures on? So how long does the effect, how long does the disruption last for? Once we know how long the, um, once we know how long the disruption lasts for, we can take our measurement and we can see how much of our measurement is actually, actually affected by the disruption. And we do that and we break it down then into two parts. There's the part of the count that isn't affected and the part of the count that is affected. And then what we do is we calculate the effect. So we just take the lane closed um, out of the number of lanes available. So if there's three lanes available and we've closed one, we've reduced the, the flow by um, a, a third or we've increased the kind of density um, by a third. So then we calculate what that delta is. It's just the affected part um, time, um, times one plus the effect. And then the exit flow is the non-affected part, so the part of the the part of your journey, the part of the count that wasn't impacted by the incident. And then we add on the affected time portion, and then we simply return the the new calculated exit flow and um, densities. And then we do that, and we calculate that, and we can see now that actually because we are in the middle of rush hour. Um, by putting on that lane closure, um, I can't remember did we put on two lanes. Let me just check the. Uh, yeah, we closed two out of the three lanes, and by closing two out of the three lanes, we increased the traffic flow to 5,200 um, per hour, and we increased the density to 104 cars per mile. This would result in breakdown traffic, uh, expect severe delays. Now that doesn't really help the traffic manager in as much as he can't really do anything about that. Right, because you have to clear up. If you've got a lorry that shed its load all over the motorway, you have to clear that up, right? You can't um, you can't just leave it uh, until three o'clock in the morning when it's nice and quiet. And um, it's not like there isn't any disruption on the road anyway. But what this this would tell him here that expects severe delays is that he can put in uh, mitigation mitigation against that severe delay. So you can put out broadcasts on the road. They can mark that road as having severe delays on it. You could even put in diversions um, uh, around the junction so you could take some vehicles off at the junction before the link started and put them on afterwards so that is a very um it's a detailed calculation but it's quite naive it's quite naive because these are fixed these are fixed um calculations so we're saying that the average speed is going to be 70 it might not be we're saying that the average speed in the incident is going to be 50 it might not be we don't know the effect of closing different kinds of lanes and we don't know the effect for for um, closing it for different lengths of time. Not that we have an option really for closing it for different lengths of time, but when as traffic managers, when the um, 
working teams on the road say, well, it's going to take us an hour to clear this. That's just an estimate, right? It might not take that long or it might take much longer than that. So we have a lot of uncertainty in there. We don't know about the average speed before um, they get into the affected area. We don't know about the average speed through the infect through the affected area. We don't know for certain how long it's going to take to clear um, the incident. So what we need really is something that's less naive um, and something that helps us deal with the uncertainty there. So what we're going to do here is um, we're going to go uh, right down here and we're going to come up with an algorithm that kind of takes um, that um, takes into consideration some of that uncertainty, right? So we're going to flex that. And in data science, one of the ways that we deal with uncertainty is we use um, what we call Monte Carlo simulation, where when the starting variables are unknown, and in this case, they are unknown, we've got a good idea what they are. In the naive version, we just, we claimed that they were known. And we said that the average speed was 70 uh, and we cl and we claimed that it, we knew it was going to take 45 minutes. But these are really starting variables and we don't really know what they are. So when we're faced with that kind of situation in data science, then what we do is we tend to use a Monte Carlo, what we call a Monte Carlo simulation. And a Monte Carlo simulation is where you have a bunch of variables that you don't know what the starting values are, but you know how they're distributed. Okay, so we're, in most cases, in, in this case, they're they're distributed normally, right? We know that um, um, if there is a speed limit, then most people will drive around the speed limit. Some people will drive um, over the speed limit. Very few people will drive very much over the speed limit. Some people will drive under the speed limit. Very few people will drive way under the speed limit. So it's kind of naturally distributed. So what we can do is we can we can simulate what would happen if we run these calculations with different starting variables that we have sampled from a normal distribution. Um, and our less naive way of um, calculating that is to do exactly that. So here we've got, we're going to start, um, obviously the day and the time is fixed because you can't plan to have an incident tomorrow at, at three o'clock, they, they happen when they happen. Um, so we can't really change the date and the hour of the day, nor the lanes available. The motorways in Garitopia, the one motorway we have in Garitopia only has three lanes, so that's fixed. But what we can do is we can get an average speed for the link. Um, and what, what we're saying here is I want a single value from a normal distribution in the range um, 70 miles an hour plus or minus um, plus or minus 10 percent. And if we just have a quick um, look at how we calculate that, then um, what we do for this one is, what we do is we get the median from the range, and then what we do is we calculate the standard deviation. Now we don't really calculate the standard deviation because we've only got a, a range and we don't know how many values fall in um, in which which bucket, as it were. But what we do know from things that we know about normal distributions is that the mean plus or minus three standard deviations gets us something like 99% of the total um, which is in the distribution. So that's close enough for our for our estimate. So that's why we have that um, divide by three there. And then what we do is once we've kind of calculated that, we've calculated the mean, we've kind of calculated a, a proxy for standard deviation. Then all we do is we take a random number from the normal distribu distribution, we multiply it by the standard deviation and add the mean. And then what that does is it will give us a, a kind of pseudo um, normal distribution that we can use to pull um, values for speed out. So when we say it's 70, it's 70 plus or minus 10% in a, in a um, normal distribution, please sample from that. So back down here, that's what we do with our average speed. So instead of actually saying we know the speed and it's 70, which we don't, we're just pretending, we're actually going to say we know we don't know the speed, we know roughly what it is, we're going to sample it for each um, for each calculation through our um, Monte Carlo simulation. And then we do exactly the same thing for the speed inside the incident. We do exactly the same thing for the minutes closed. The engineers on the road have told us it's going to be closed for an hour. Okay, well, we're going to say here it's in this particular instance it's it's 30 minutes but we've put a we've put a 40 percent flex on that okay and um, same kind of thing 
here um, we can't we can't go above um, all of the lanes we've got. We can't suddenly have four lanes, but whether or not we close one lane or two lanes um, affects how the traffic flows and the density. So we're going to randomly choose to close one or two lanes here just to kind of model that. And then we do exactly the same thing as we did before. We calculate the entry flow and the entry um, density, and then we calculate the exit flow and the exit density. When it comes to, to the actual flow, the flow is different because we don't we don't have to do we don't have to calculate a kind of pseudo um, we don't have to calculate a pseudo normal distribution for that because as you remember when I showed you through the data engineering part um, we actually calculated when we were aggregating our data up we calculated the max and the min and the mean and the standard deviation so we actually know these values and we don't have to we don't have to kind of say, well, we'll divide by three because three standard deviations gets us about all of it. We actually know the values for this particular one. So having known the values, what we can do is we can use um, a function in um, Python um, called um, trunk norm, which is a truncated normal distribution. Um, in, in the real world, in nature, um, normal distributions are, are infinite um, in in both directions we want a truncated one which basically says between two values so it's the way of it's a way of pulling out a, a sample variable from a normal distribution where it's between um, a minimum value and a maximum value so all we need to do is we pass in our max our min our mean and our standard deviation that we calculated from the induction uh, data and then we just we just um, execute this formula, which basically says the minimum minus the mean divided by the standard deviation is the first um, parameter. Second parameter is the max minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Um, and then what we do is we return one sample from that. So this part here creates the distribution. The second part down here pulls a sample from that distribution and returns it to us. So we're far more accurate um, for, with our flow information because we have um, so much more data. And then what we do in exactly the same way, we um, calculate our exit density and our exit flow, and then we make that comparison. But what we've got here is the ability to actually run that 100 times. So we can have a, a simulation which runs 100 times. Um, what we can then do down the bottom here is to um, every time that we run through that, we add the row. So we pick our starting variables. We sample our starting variables from a distribution. So they are different every time, but they are different in a, they are, they are different, but they still have a value which is possible um, uh, related to their probability of being chosen. Um, so for example, it's more likely to be closer to 70 miles an hour as a speed because most people will drive a, a um, around that, it will be unlikely to be um, above that and very unlikely to be much above that. But those people do exist, so those variables will be pooled. Um, the calculation will be done. We'll find our our exit criteria, our, our exit flow and density, and we'll record that for every one of the hundred simulations that we do. And then what we'll do is once we've exhausted the one hundred simulations we will sort our result set by the exit density um, in descending order. So we get the kind of worst first so we can see what is the best thing and um, what is the best thing that we can do. And then we'll just show the, the top 20 just for um, just for visualization. Um, so if we run that. And then so you can see what we've got here is we can see that because we are in the middle of rush hour, so it's it's 9 a.m. on the 3rd of March, um, we can see that our traffic is already um, unstable because we're already um, in the rush hour, so we're already expecting delays. And if we start to close off um, more lanes, you can see that um, it goes from expect delays to traffic breakdown. We have severe delays. We can see under some circumstances, under some scenarios with different speeds. So there's 47, the average speed being 47.5. We can see that we, we don't have much of an impact. Um, we don't have much of an impact um, on that. The, um, 
uh, entry um, destin um, density was 43 and the exit uh, density has gone up to 98. So we've doubled the, the number of vehicles, but it's still it's still in that unstable, it's still in the you're going to get delayed um, range as opposed to complete traffic breakdown. But looking at this, you would see that most of the times where you closed one lane, and obviously there's the number of minutes that it's going to be closed for as well, and um, flexed um, over that period of time, you can see that most of the exit criteria, most of the exit categories are um, breakdown of traffic expected severe delays, and only sometimes will you just get away with, with adding to the delay. So if you're a traffic manager, you would choose not to close two lanes if you possibly could. If you can do, if you can clear the incident by only closing one lane, you would do that because you're much more likely to stay in the unstable, not really making a big impact um, range. If you can't, so some of the reasons why you couldn't is if a lorry has shred, shed its load over um, two lanes, for example, you have no option but to close the two lanes in order to, to clear it away. Then you know that in the balance of probability from doing this is that you're going to get a breakdown in traffic with severe delays and you have to put in other traffic management and um, mitigation. So you have to try to put in diversions or or speed limits beforehand. Um, putting in speed limits beforehand uh, works here. So it works on that um, entry flow. So the flow of traffic and the density of traffic um, prior to the incident, if you put in a speed limit, um, will actually make make these a lot a lot better numbers. So you have less of a flow going into the incident. That's why you often see on um, motorways in, in this country, you'll see f apparently for no real reason, you'll see 40 or 50 mile an hour speed limits put in the, the what we call smart motorways. Well, well, that's why it's because we're trying to slow the flow into an incident that could possibly be be um, dealt with and finished by the time that, that, that you get there, so you may never see it. Um, but what this does is this tells traffic managers that if they can, they should only close one lane, and if they can't close one lane only, then they should put in other um, traffic mitigation, um, yeah, other traffic control mitigation. And so lastly, we get to, well, where, where do we go from here? Have we have we finished? And the answer to that question is no, we, we haven't finished. Um, there's still other things that we can do. So, for example, we haven't taken into consideration the shockwave. So, uh, shockwave basically gets its name from because the shockwave of, of a delay travels backwards up the link um, that you are on. So, as you approach, um, as you approach, if you're one of the first cars that approaches a traffic incident like that, you'll have to slow down and you'll be delayed as you funnel in. But as more and more traffic and piles up at the start of the incident, then um, you start to get kind of like a tailback effect. And what it really does is it stretches the length of the of the incident. So the incident, you may cone off 100 meters of road in order to write a, a, a tipped up lorry, but after 15 minutes or so, it's, it's probably, you know, um, half a kilometer or a kilometer. So what that does is it really extends the length of your, your incident. We haven't taken that in, into consideration. Um, and there's and there's so there's lots of ways that we can improve on this um, in straight maths. There's also ways that we can improve on it by um, getting more technology onto the roads in Garytopia. So there we have two ways. So we can go back to the customer. We can say we've made an improvement. So instead of just lying, relying on gut feel and well, I've been doing this for 20 years and I think we should do that. Actually, we've put some data behind it. We've put some data science behind it. We're giving you, we're letting you make real choices based on real calculations. So that's an improvement. We can also suggest ways that we can improve in terms of taking the original algorithm that we've got here and actually making it better, taking into consideration things like shock waves and, and um, other traffic mitigation. So for example, what would happen um, in this situation, if we actually did put in a diversion at the junction before um, the link with the incident on it, what kind of effect would that have? And we're not we're not taking that into consideration here. And we can also suggest to the customer that if they put in more technology so that we can get more information, we can improve this. So we've actually made a difference. We've we've um, we've pointed out some future research that can can happen, and we've pointed out ways that that this can be improved with technology going forward. And that's basically um, all, in a, all in a day's work for, uh, for a data scientist. That's kind of what we do on a day-to-day -day, uh, day -day basis.
So I must apologize for the um, delay in getting started, but um, now that we've actually gotten going um, and we've got to the end, I think we probably have maybe two minutes or something like that. I don't know if A, there's anybody here or B, if anybody's got any questions, but um, now is the now is your opportunity to to shout out if you do. We've still got a few people here, Gary. Um, I'm afraid at the moment there are no questions. I suggest we just give it a minute or two, um, yeah, let the stream probably. catch up and then we'll see if there's any any questions. Yeah, we're pretty much hard on the on the well past the past the uh, soft stop and right at the end of the hard stop. <laughs> <laughs> we are, I'm afraid, yes. <laughs> Never mind. I mean, if there are any questions or if anybody wants to talk about it um, or got any comments or just questions, then, you know, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or email or wherever you can, wherever you can find me, because I will talk all day with people about um, data science and this kind of thing. So we've got one question. Yes. And uh, that's from Caleb saying, as more EVs come online, would you be able to leverage the data from them? So yeah, so that's a so that's a great um, that is a great question. Um, e EVs have a lot more telemetry built into them um, than than other cars do. So obviously, the, the answer to that question is yes, it would be great. But obviously, there's a permissions and a, a data protection um, thing there, and obviously, other, some users w won't be happy about you know their data being used for anything else, and we'll, we'll turn that off. But that is definitely. Um, it's definitely an avenue for for better information and better information always leads to better algorithms which leads to um fewer fewer traffic incidents other places that we can pull in information from as well is things like ways and things like that because what what <laughs> one of the issues with traffic management is you could put in traffic management and you can put in a diversion but you can't make people follow it right and um it you could put in you could put in a diversion to go one particular way at a junction and ways may say no nope, this road is blocked i've recalculated your route for you and that recalculation isn't necessarily the diversion that you've put in um and so that's where that's where the people are going to go so you you've put in a diversion because it's it's the way you want people to go for maximum um, vehicle flow in the entire network or that area of the network and ways will come along and go no 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 don't do that I'll, I'll direct you around you and send you a completely different way so it would be great if we could actually if we could get in and uh, get the data from from um, applications like ways and actually find out where they are sending people and where people are going and then you know that kind of information can impact um, we can take in consideration in future algorithms and and actually um, and actually know what people are likely to do. We have a question. We have a question from somebody who's marked themselves an, as anonymous, saying, "Will the notebooks be available?" Uh, I hadn't given it any thought, but sure, uh, why not? Um, it's it's basically just a bit of fun. Um, it's just kind of. Um, I guess it is the code equivalent of a stream of consciousness. It's just it's just a case of, hey, I think this might be interesting. Other people might think it's interesting to um, have a uh, let's watch while we go through this kind of thing because it's it's what I do kind of on a day to day basis. Um, but sure, um, you can have uh, you can get the notebooks, uh, the notebooks. That's absolutely no problem um, with the usual caveat that don't come running to me if you burn your house down with them. <laughs> That said, if you do have any questions, then feel free to come. I mean, don't wait till your house burns down and then go, oh, well, I can't. I mean, if you've got questions for sure, um, ask them once you've got the notebook. Yeah. Cool. Those are the questions we had. And as oh, we right. are after 5 p.m., I suggest that we, we draw this to a close. Thank you, Gary. That was fascinating as always. Um, thank you ever so much. That was that was really good. Um, thank you to everybody who's attended as well. Um, we'll draw this session to a close at this point. So thank you, everybody, and uh, I hope you have a good evening. Take care. All right, guys. Take care. Bye bye.